I'd like to welcome Vaishnavi Sundar to the Women's Rights Network podcast for a second time. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good to see you too, sis. And I am really pleased because you have come to talk to us about the film that you are making. And that film is called Behind the Looking Glass. And it's about the stories of trans widows and children of transitioners. So firstly, just in case anybody's listening and they're not too sure what that means, who are trans widows? Sure. Trans widows, uh, as a terminology, has been picked up by women whose husbands or partners have opted to transition either socially or surgically or any other means possible. And it's kind of a term that brought a lot of these women together. And it is their terminology. And I'd like to just stick with that because it's a film about them. And when when I stumbled upon the website and read a few testimonials and that word kind of stayed in my memory as well. So it was just easy to call them trans widows because that's how they call themselves. And um, it's just it's just easy to understand as well in the sense that there's often this argument why are you calling them widows? The husbands are not dead. They're just transitioning. It is such a horrible thing to say, et cetera, et cetera. But I suppose these women can choose to call themselves whatever the hell they want, mm-hmm. number one. And number two, we have all sorts of um, circumstances where the widow uh, suffix is used. We have golf widows. We have, yes. I don't know, all kinds of other ways in which uh, they talk about an absent husband. Why, why is this an issue. So I never really paid a lot of attention about, oh, should they be calling themselves widows or is it even right or nothing, nothing. That's what they call themselves. And if I'm claiming to make a film about a group of women, the least I can do is stick with the terminology that they want for themselves. And that's how, that's how it, uh, that I, I suppose that's how you can understand the term trans widows for anybody who's new to this whole phenomenon. Yes. Yes. And that, uh... And for, I guess for further information, um, the website to go to would be the Trans Widows website. Um, simply pop the word into Google and it will come straight up. Um, and we definitely recommend taking a look at um, Children of Transitioners and Trans Widows websites. It's transwidowsvoices.org. It's just what it says it is, transwidowsvoices.org. Yeah. How did this film even get started? Why? Why this film? Right. There, there was no aha moment for me choosing to, you know, sort of make a film on this subject. But while I was making Dysphoric, uh, which is my previous film, and it's about young girls, young women opting to transition and become, I'm air quoting here, males, so to speak. And what are the circumstances under which they go through it? A, a kind of a fleeting thought came to my mind about what if they are with somebody, you know? How do they feel about it? You know, in sort Mm -hmm. of a strange fleeting manner, this thought was sort of jogging in the back of my mind. And I never really paid attention to it because you know how it is when you're in the middle of uh, completing a film, you're just consumed Mm -hmm. by it. But every now and then I did think about it because they mention girlfriends and they talk about partners. And I constantly had a feeling that, although I'd never asked them about it because I hadn't fully understood this myself. But gradually I stumbled upon a few testimonials and a couple of trans widows themselves had written to me saying that they had watched dysphoric and that they are really grateful for it and that they should, Hmm. that I should consider um, exploring this particular phenomenon because we're talking about adult males who are choosing to transition. Now, obviously as a filmmaker, I am only interested in topics that concern women, women's experiences and things like that. While I was making dysphoric, a lot of people made a comment saying that, what about men? What about young boys who are transitioning? Yes, it's a very, very valid and important thing. And it's uh, very dangerous as well. There are a lot of young boys opting to transition and call themselves females. It is a film that needs to be made. Only I'm not making it because perhaps some men can if it affect, if it concerns them. Similarly, when you talk about older transition males, I didn't want to make a film about them. I was interested in what happens to the families that they leave behind. What, yeah. what What is exactly going on? Because when you look it up online, you read about all the happy families that just f- flipped over as if one night this man made an announcement and they just flipped over and suddenly they're a happy couple of a different way, of a different type. It's mm. as if 
all the years of uh, conversation that they should have had didn't happen. And just overnight, they just are this happy couple posing for photographs, speaking in talk shows and things like that. That just did not sit well with me, especially because if a man seated right next to you has dressed up in a manner that makes a caricature out of a female. Uh -huh. And for her, the wife, to sit beside him and, you know, hug him and embrace him and say that, oh, I never thought I would be a lesbian or something like that. That was just so appalling. And I, th I suppose it's a culmination of all of these things that made me kind of deep dive into the issue. And I suppose one evening I was just having a chat with uh, this friend of mine, Flo. Maybe I should make a film about that. And she said, you definitely should. That was it. Okay. That was it. You and don't fly. I, yes. <laughs> and, we, and I just started um, exploring some more. And then I wrote to um, Tinsel from Translators Voices on Twitter. And she pointed me towards many uh, resources on her website. And then I had an opportunity to meet her during Portsmouth uh, Philia. And we had a great chat. And it all seemed to... Mm, um, I don't know what's the word, uh, kind of make my thoughts about this film a bit more concrete mm -hmm. that I want to do it because these there is a huge gap in the whole transgender narrative where we are completely sidelining the wives or the, one, the only wives that you hear about are the ones that are happy, although I have my suspicion about whether they are happy at all, you know. Yeah, sure. So, so it's like a a process of me going back and forth, reading up about it more and more and understanding what's going on. And another very important and significant aspect of this is, as you know, I'm from India and in India, the whole concept of transgenderism sort of uh, has branched out in two different ways. Uh, you know, the age old cultural, sociocultural phenomenon called hijras that a lot uh -huh. of people often appropriate as somehow justifying that this has existed for so long and some and that somehow justifies giving young children puberty blockers is justified or right? something like that you know um but in within the hijra community hijra is an umbrella term within them there are so many different little sub cultural groups as well one such group is called the kothis k o t t h i s kothis and these are men who are not hijras these are kothis where as a community they are known to be family men they have a double life. They have a wife. Some may have children. And they cross-dress. This is their mm -hmm. thing. They are kotis. They are known to be that. And they are accepted as a cultural community of sorts in India within the Hijra community. And I have often wondered what the wife feels about this. Most of the time, the kotis are not, you know, your urban, educated, upper-class kind of people. These are in rural areas. Or even if they are in the urban setting, they are probably not very well to do in terms of economic um, affluence, if you will. So what what's going on in the mind of this wife who has a husband who goes away in the night and, you know, has his own double life and comes back and she's expected to be this devoted woman accepting her mm -hmm. husband, however he is. And the tipping point was, when I say tipping point, it was all tipping points, but this one film in Tamil Nadu that came out where this uh, man there's a euphemism in India. When you say you, that man went to Bombay, that means that this man had had sex change surgery. Nah. Because Bombay is notorious for these alleyways where all these surgeries happen illegally. And, you know, there are other hijra trans-identified males who have their own communities and things who perform these surgeries because they won't go to doctors and things like that. Of course, now the phenomenon is completely different. You can walk into any government office and anybody uh, can get a free surgery now in taxpayers' money. But that's a different topic to discuss. So when you go to Bombay, that means that, you know, you're going to come back looking a bit different. Uh, and this film that was made uh, had this man uh, who had a son come back with uh, a surgery done with uh, breasts the size of, I don't know, a football or something. and um, his wife was just shocked in the beginning. She's confused and everything. And he just declares that this is who he is and she just has to put up with it. And in the end, the filmmaker has made it as if, well, why did you have to do all of these things so alone? You could have just told me I would have supported you along the way. Mm -hmm. And the son is shown to be this cool guy, cool little kid that to me, you're just my father. I don't care how you look, you know. 
that sort of a thing. I was just mm-hmm. curious, but it doesn't look real. Is she not? Is she not going to question him about manipulating her into, you know, capitulating to this ideology, to this this phenomenon that he just mm-hmm. disappears from her life, doesn't care if she is okay or not, doesn't care about the child, and says that he's going to live his life this way. How is that okay to the wife? Now, a filmmaker can make a story where the wife is absolutely fine with it and the child is absolutely fine. It doesn't mean that's a reality. No. Uh, especially when you have so many Kothis in India who come out like this in the night and they have their own night private life, social life. And these women are just sitting at home having to probably deal with uh, tiny infant children by themselves, yeah. most likely riddled in poverty. I, we don't know that. We don't know the truth about it. And only recently I'm hearing stories where courts are kind of being open about verdicts. So when you go for a divorce, you can, of course, apply for a divorce when things don't work out. It's not like uh, the court can force you to stay married. They will try and put you through all kinds of really annoying arbitration and psychological evaluation and things like that. But ultimately, if you want a divorce, you can get a divorce after a really long, drawn, hard battle. Um, Recently, they have openly started talking about how if a male has opted to do sex change surgery, that is solid grounds based on which the wife can ask uh-huh. for a divorce. Okay. Yeah. And it's not like, it's it's a it's a funny thing that they have to actually explicitly cite that openly because these things are often very hush-hush, right? But you can now read uh, court verdicts online. You can just type the name of uh, the case and you can read the statement and the response and things like that. Um, so I was just fascinated how the court is actually explicitly saying it, while at the same time, Supreme Court um, had all kinds of people making petitions for transgender people's equality rights and this and that. Mm-hmm. I was just finding that a bit of a contradiction there. But anyway, good thing is, I suppose the the courts are saying that because they believe that if a man has had surgery, he's no longer a man. Therefore, it's not a marriage between a man and a woman, you see. Ah, okay. So it's coming from that sort of a conservative attitude. where It's okay, not that it's it abusive sense. to the woman. No, 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 no okay. way. We have marital rape that has still not been declared illegal. So yeah. no way this uh, counts as a positive win for female uh, divorce seekers or anything like that. No, not, not a chance. But I still found it interesting that they announced it explicitly. Man opted for surgery, valid ground for divorce or something like that. And it's a precedent, right? You you, you set yeah, precedent yeah. in law. Um, similarly, for a lot of horrible things that are changes in terms of curriculum and uh, medical textbooks and everything, those are all precedents as well. Dangerous precedents, if, if anything. But yeah. uh, in the middle of all of that chaos, I was finding this to be a positive thing because not only did that woman choose to not put up with his nonsense, um, <laughs> The court guaranteed that, yes, she can be divorced from this man, not because the court cares about the woman, but he's no longer a man. So, you know, it's not a family. It's not a family anymore. But so poor reason, but good outcome for her. Something like that. Yes. And not many cases, though, just a few. That's why I suppose there will be many more cases where women are seeking divorce by mutual consent, by not disclosing the actual reason. Who knows? Okay, that, that exists. That can be done in India, can it? Mutual consent divorce. Yes, yes. Mutual mm-hmm. consent divorce exists. And um, there are some protocols as to, you know, you file for it and then you stay apart for six months. You come back and if you're still feeling like it, then the court can grant your divorce, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, in some cases, the court try to kind of be patriarchal about the whole thing and tell the women that, you know, uh, your husband hit you. Well, this is how men are, you know, you things like that. That's mm. a completely different issue. They do that. They try to brainwash the woman into just sucking it up and living with an abusive man. They have done that. But very, very gradually, they are allowing these things to come out, one, and also considering that to be a um, valid reason for divorce. To me, it doesn't matter what you think uh, about family structure or anything like that. I'm just glad that that woman is out of that relationship when she didn't want it. Yeah. And I'm glad that we have you to be able to tell us about these stories because it's still so difficult for so many women in India to tell the stories themselves, isn't it? So much so, I I believe it, it's been too difficult to find 
any women from India for your film? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This case that I talked to you about, I tried to chase after. It was in uh, some court in, I don't know, high court in Rajasthan. I'm not sure. Uh, but thing is, in, in it's similar to the British system because, I mean, you 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 were here for many we're years. partly responsible yes yes but uh, the system is such that if you are um, if you're if you're filing a case against somebody you're immediate, immediately removed from the proceedings right the victims removed from the proceedings it becomes about the perpetrator versus the state so it's very hard to find out who that woman is, who the aggrieved woman is for us to maybe, you know, try and find out if she would be interested in talking to us or something like that. But I'm 100%, I'm 110% sure that she doesn't have a vocabulary for any of these things. She would probably mm-hmm. just think that, you know, he he's not a man. How can I be married to him? This is what he wants to do. How can I be married to him? She's not going to be able to sort of articulate that this is manipulation. This is autogynophilia or that this is, I'm a trans widow now or anything like we don't have that mm-hmm. vocabulary. And also, 99% of the time, anybody who's speaking anything upwards of Delhi, people in the South can't understand because we speak completely different languages. Sometimes even within South, we don't understand each other. Between states, we have different languages. And within a state, there are so many different dialects. So it's one of the most profoundly um, difficult thing to find some sort of a uniformity across India. I mean, you can say that you can use English, but we are restricting that to people who can understand English, which means urban, educated, middle class, upper class kind of people, which is basically um, probably 30% of 1.4 billion. It's a lot, but that's not where most of the chaos is happening. As you can imagine, poverty would lead you to more violence and depravity would lead you to more um, depravity, I suppose, you know, your access to mobile phones and free streaming pornography mm. and your uh, ability to just hit your wife and you know rape her and things like that i would imagine it happens so much more in places where you're not educated or where you're not doing very well and you resort to alcoholism and you treat your wife like an object yeah. i would imagine it happens more over there but those women don't have the vocabulary those women don't even understand what's going on with this man and so they this- She's probably thinking at that time, I just want to stay alive right now so that I can protect this tiny child. That's it. Yeah, so the, there's clearly a heck of a lot of challenges in India to even help the women have the words to explain what's happening to them um, before they can necessarily act on it, although it is good that they can get divorced um, if, I guess families as well as courts allow it there must be great social pressure not to get divorced um and whilst there's no um indian women in the film yet hopefully in future that you there may be there may be more um you do have significant numbers of women from uh different countries and non-English speakers. Tell us about, as far as you can, the women who are in the film. Sure. So it has been a wild ride, sis, seeking Mm -hmm. out stories like this from, you know, the World Wide Web. It's like punching in the dark and you, you put something out and you hope that you get a positive response. But I have been so beyond amazed at how desperate many women were to actually find that person who's even seeking out such stories because probably they have spent years pondering why nobody's talking about this. Nobody's yeah. talking about the wives and things like that. Now, I'm not saying I'm some really cool person to have put this story together or anything like that. I'm just talking well, about... <laughs> I'm just talking about how they have been waiting to say their story for so long. It mm. was just a matter of someone asking them once, yeah. you know? It came to a point where I was thinking, would I have enough women to talk about this to a point where, well, I just need to now take a call not to interview new women anymore. Hmm. It's not, it's not rare. It's definitely not rare. Um, I've had women from speak to me like for on a research basis because they can't afford to have their voices even anonymously in a film like this, because if they narrate their story, 
perhaps it is just too peculiar in the way the abuse has been meted out that they were they are so they were so sure that their abuser would find out about it and probably abuse them further they didn't uh-huh. want to risk it at all sure. uh, so they have spoken to me as as a form of uh, you know just so i can take some understanding of what has happened what different ways in which these women have been abused on re- yeah. for a research purpose but not necessarily they were not happy to be in the film and things like that so i let's mm-hmm. just let's just not even talk about the plethora of those stories right now we can talk about still we can still talk about the number of women who ha- who have um agreed to be in the film yeah um we have 18 stories 18 wow. stories of wow. which eight stories are anonymous okay 18 is a very very large number of people and stories for yes. a film and the uh, hours and hours that they have talked about is as if the dam was broken they mm-hmm. they they were just not able to stop telling me about things and it was very difficult for me to curtail it as a sort of an interview where i send them 10 questions and i had to restrict them to like answering it in a sort of a way that is succinct and with brevity and it was just not possible it was as if they were you ask them and they open their mouth and that they, they just couldn't stop it they just couldn't and then they are telling me one story more darker than the previous one and then new ways in which they were manipulated new ways in which they try to stick around and they tried their real best and some of them are still with such a partner whose interview i couldn't um, i couldn't get that interview for so long because she was still living in that house and she had to cancel in the last minute because he wouldn't leave and uh-huh. then i was very very patient i said i it's okay it's okay if you're canceling it must be for a reason i'm going mm-hmm. to not be you know angry about it or upset about it you tell me one day you're happy to talk to me and i'm going to record you doesn't matter um some th- things like that so yeah. we have a woman from germany we have a woman from japan we have well unfortunately we did have a story from france slash belgium but that's the story which was just too dark and too specific that she was really afraid it mm-hmm. it was the it was the most grotesque one based on my experience of listening to these women the kind of porn adult thing that he did to her and he did with himself it was the most grotesque story that i had to listen to again and again and unfortunately and completely understandably she can't be in the film but mm-hmm. i thought my god if i had to put this story people would not believe that this is a real story that's how yeah. that's how out of this world it was just complete outlandish biz- bizarre things that he has asked the woman to do and how she at one point was just so trapped in all of this and she had to oblige and eventually when she tried to leave how he pulled her back and you know so on and so forth it was all mm-hmm. really really dark but the 18 women um they are also diverse in the sense that not only are they from different countries where they speak non english languages but they are also of different age groups some of them uh for some of them it happened when they were much younger but now they are this super wise amazing older women where they talk about it with with still a lot of pain and things but as if uh they have ta- taken that experience and turned it into something powerful and they are sharing it with me not as a way they are telling me a sad story but that happened to me but look where i am now yeah yeah and that was so powerful to listen to and then there were really young women as well to, who probably had that man's experience a man's intimacy as a first ever experience or something like that and mm-hmm. it had to be like this riddled with pornography and cross dressing and all of those things and almost all the women in the story have somehow had this conviction about not letting that consume them and for the sake of themselves or for children or for other women because they know how hard it is to be in a relationship like this so even as a means to you know put their hand out to get one women woman out of this uh, hell they were willing to speak about it to say that you know they would have narrated such painful things sis and then in the end they would also reassure you saying well i thought i was going to die but i'm even proud of myself for having made it this mm-hmm. far or something like that 
So you have women from, yeah, so many different uh, backgrounds and cultural references. And you, you can imagine in Japan how it might be very, very difficult for a woman to speak about all of these things because it's a highly patriarchal and because J Japan is riddled with pornography in itself, how difficult yeah. must it be for her to say that my husband's watching porn? She would probably be laughed away. You know, mm. it's it's what men do, that sort of a thing. But despite all of that, she managed to tell her story and she's grateful that she had Twitter to talk about all of these things, et cetera, et cetera. So we've, we've had like a real collection of characters and personalities and just amazing, amazing women come forth and talk about it. They're terrified of their exes, no doubt. At least mm -hmm. the ones that still have that that fear, that looming fear of how he might come after her at some point because I can't even imagine uh, that fear leaving them anytime soon because that's how deep into it they were when they were together. So I can imagine how it might probably feel as if they would never be free of this. You know, it's like an experience such as that. Yeah. You'd never feel free from that. So I'm really pleased and privileged to have the trust of all these women who basically just poured their heart to me and mm. trusted me with some of the most intimate things that they had to experience. And one of one of the women even said that I should be a therapist or something. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, well, if being a therapist, if being a good therapist is just about listening, then it's a very low bar. <laughs> therapists should do a lot more. Therapists should make you feel great. If anything, they were making me feel great. They were worried about me because they just unloaded their really grotesque story and they were checking on me, emailing me a few days later. Are you doing okay? And things like that. <sighs> These women basically just like held me, just held me the whole time, checking in yeah. and, you know, things like that. So these are my sheroes and they are from all over the world. Many women who couldn't be in the film, who could even have a chat with me for research purposes have written to me privately to say that this has happened to me as well. I can't talk about it to you or to anyone else right now, but just know that this film is going to be so helpful for so many people like me. So those things kind of drove me, I suppose, mm -hmm. to, despite all the challenges, to just power through somehow. So you must then, having heard all of those stories, the women who are in the film and those who aren't, so many unique stories but are there any themes that run through those stories is there something that they do have in common sure oh that's that's going to be like a big part a, a big section in the film because the commonalities are kind of very very sinister the way it creeps in and the way it sort of spreads through, it's like that uh, camel and the tent or something, a story that I used to know as a child where there's a camel that's outside in a desert, it's very cold. The camel says, let me just put my foot in and I will feel less cold. And then slowly the camel is inside the tent and the man uh -huh. is out. Uh -huh. it, remind, it reminds me of that story. So it gradually sort of sneaks up on you and then one thing leads to another boundary pushing boundary pushing then slowly violating that pushed boundary and then entitlement to accept the new reality and then starting to abuse them if they even so much as resist or put a word in to say that they're uncomfortable or anything like that it's just this uh, flat out capitulation that they were demanding from their wives that kind of theme seems common many of the men almost assumed that the wives would never leave them. That's and true. it kind of worked well for them that, you know, to have a family, to have a wife, it kind of gives you a social status. You know, if, if you're mm -hmm. a person um, in, in, in front of a society, you kind of have the status of being a married man with a, with a very subservient wife, you know. And these men found it almost funny when these women were saying, I've had enough, I'm going to leave. Mm. And this one particular story kind of, um, she, she is part of our film. She's a lecturer. She's American. And this one time she was talking about how she wanted to have a break and she was going away for a few days and she's letting her husband know that she's leaving now, the cab's outside or something. 
and he doesn't even look away from the book he was reading apparently and he says while you're gone i'll think about whether i need you or i'll think about why i need you or something like that so she says that that was her moment uh, a moment where she realized that this is it it's not yeah. worth it they they almost all of them have this weird feeling that i suppose it's a male thing right even in a marriage that's outside of this whole trans uh, phenomenon you would find it that men often find it hard to believe that a woman says no to them or a woman says i need a divorce or something like that yeah. so that kind of pattern is is very strong in stories like these because now they have the support of the liberal world right um, the 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 newspapers got them the academia mm-hmm. taken the marketing the ads everything is taken it's it's their world right now so when they have that sort of a clout mm-hmm. uh, after this ideology they feel even more sure that their wife's not going to leave because where is she going to go who is she, who is she, who's going to believe her story who's going to believe her version of the story i am the standing and the brave one you know things like that so that was kind of common amongst all the stories that i heard um the other was of course this whole uh, conundrum to do with child custody almost all of them gave the women so much grief over uh who's going to have the children and if the children were to go to the trans identified males house 99% of the time they were experiencing weird things in the house like you know they would have a partner and they'd probably have some sexual references in the house or that so one mother was afraid that her ex partner would i don't know touch or wear her daughter's clothes during the days that the children have to be with him and this this feels mm. felt palpable to me even though i was talking to them on zoom i can't even i mean my heart was in my throat when they were mentioning that because i hadn't thought about it that way even if it's a teenage daughter she's she's her child uh, his child and you know when you share days you go to his house that's his space yeah and he has all these really weird songs and sexual dresses and everything and there are children in the house and the mothers are not very happy about it but they are not allowed to say anything and things like that oh of course there's uh, this one woman uh, who i interviewed from australia where the australian law kind of says that there is nothing that we can do you have to share custody and this little child apparently is visibly sad on the days that he has to go there he would take a long time to get ready he would eat and when he finishes those days and comes back to his mother he comes running to her mm-hmm. like, but she can't not send him there and you know there's so many dangers looming over this this other girl who who is not going to be in the film but she mentioned about how she ended up having witnessed a sexual act while she was in that house a little girl she said uh, well i say little girl I, i mean a teenage girl when she was uh, at her father's place she saw her father and this partner or something engage in some sort of sexual activity and it was all laughed away and you know it's as if the girl wouldn't be traumatized about it or anything like that you know mm. so that that kind of theme about how to deal with children was also kind of very very bizarre and that was also common amongst so when i say all these things of course i'm not saying literally all the 18 stories had this i'm talking about a majority of them uh, a yeah. majority had probably a very high intensity of what i just said majority some of them probably had like a a version of what i had just said but overall all of them were manipulated gaslighted had their boundaries broken constantly been lied to constantly and you know just completely discarded the wife at the end of all of it it is domestic abuse it is but who is going to tell those men that because they are the standing and brave ones you see and the woman's just unnecessarily making a ruckus why wouldn't she just accept this lesbian wife that she has now suddenly had you've spent months planning producing interviewing editing it's still ongoing 
It's a massive project. You're one woman. Tell us about some of the challenges that you've had putting this together. Mm. I mean, despite everything, I just would like to think of the finish line every day. You know, mm-hmm. I, I constantly keep thinking of the finish line. It's like uh, the old habit. I used to be an athlete and I always, the day before the uh, track events, I always had this feeling of envisioning myself at the beginning of the line and the gun goes and I'm running and I'm watching myself run ahead of all the other girls and I'm finishing the race successfully you know I just do Uh this mental thing in my mind all the time and I always have a feeling that time is such a beautiful thing that soon enough you would have finished it and you look back and you think how the hell did I do that because that's how I thought when I started doing this for it this for it is over and I still have no idea how I managed to do it that was even harder because that was during peak lockdown Mm. stress was high trauma was high and this is a subject matter that really is one of the most traumatizing subjects because I am no stranger to gender dysphoria myself growing as a gender non-conforming kid etc etc this film has been something else in terms of challenges and dealing with stories over and over again I don't know what it is about listening to difficult stories that I compartmentalize or what. I have no idea. But I seem to power through it and put these things together thinking film is the thing. Film is the thing. It'll be over. It'll be good. It'll be over. It'll be good. Mm -hmm. It is me most of the time. I miss the kind of robust editing room where you have a couple of assistants. You discuss. You debate. You you ask yourself why should this shot go after that shot? Why should that be a wide shot? Why should this be a you know a profile shot and things like? That. I miss that so much. Mm. So nowadays I just talk to myself. Yeah. Just I have a shot to put together and I'm just talking aloud. Ninety percent of the time, somebody in the house comes to the room and asks if I said something to them, but I would just be like, no, I'm just talking to myself. I'm meditating. This is normal behavior for any adult female. (laughs) Don't ask me questions. Please leave me alone. I'm busy right now talking to myself. Taking your own good advice. Well, I hope so. But sometimes it's uh, perplexing, isn't it? Because the responsibility of wanting to tell this story with honesty and integrity is such a huge responsibility, sis. And it Mm -hmm. keeps me up at night because it's not even like, it's not even like they are saying something and they don't care if I, whatever, I make a film. They don't, I know. It's not like that. It's, they are, they're literally rooting for this film. Yeah. And the whole feminist community is rooting for this film. And that's not a pressure that I can handle at all. I constantly have acid reflux. I always had insomnia. I deal with kind of nightmares and I have hallucinations of listening to um, distress calls of animals in my ear constantly. Mm -hmm. I've been dealing with this for a while, but this one, um, I just feel extremely, extremely not scared, but terrified of will I, will I do a good job with these stories? Mm -hmm. Because it's like the women have cut part of themselves and given it to me, right? That's how I see yeah. it. Yeah. And that's no joke. And I have the responsibility to mold it into like a person, a physical person who can then go forth and tell the story further and, you know, leave it there as a, as a, as an important piece of history for the future generation. It's not, it's not so simple. It's a huge responsibility. So some days I think that, I mean, I have really dark thoughts. But mm. other days I just think, well, this is a challenge because filmmaking is also much much to do with content, yes, but also the uh, craft of making the film itself. So you learn new things in terms of uh, a software, and I kind of get ge- I, I kind of geek out on that and distract <laughs> myself that way, learn a new technology or yeah. figure out how to do something in that little menu item or something like that and yeah. distract myself that way. And when you learn it, when you figure it out, that glorious feeling of having understood something very, very complicated, 
is yeah. the most satisfying thing and i know i think well if i had an editor who's doing this i would have never learned this myself so yeah yeah <laughs> so some, okay. some some self improvement going on there with the uh, with the, with the tech and the editing yeah yeah i'm with you on yes. that one <laughs> with you on that yes, one yes absolutely yeah because it's so it it's good, so much yeah. more it's so much more enjoyable to have worked something out for yourself um sometimes yes. than, than have been shown how to do it yeah yes so now then it becomes just an actual task of putting these pieces of puzzle together you know mm. the women have said so many different things using so many different words it's like those words just sort of form a pattern and then you figure out that pattern and you put them together in clusters and then you make the most chronological sequence of those clusters in a way that it tells a story in the most efficient manner you do so many different permutations combinations and things like that now you if you get caught up in the middle of all of those things then suddenly the whole feeling of loneliness or the effect of uh, the the stories that they have shared with me kind of is simmer down is sort of put in the back burner because i'm just engrossed in fitting this puzzle together right mm-hmm. like, okay here she talks about pornography oh there she talks about pornography i need to put them together in a way that it all makes sense so that puzzle kind of keeps me going as well but yeah. it is hard um the animation for the animation i have some female animators who kind of do this create these really amazing visuals for Fabulous. the film mm-hmm. they they have my deepest respect and my biggest gratitude for their time you know especially in a climate like this that they have chosen to work with me uh, in making this film it's just as much their film as it is mine that th- that we have come forward without having to worry about oh that na- nazi bigger transform <laughs> i'd never want to work with her you know they didn't think that and i'm so are grateful these, are these women in india three women are in india mm-hmm. and hopefully one animator i'm just in the discussion stage with the pakistani animator right oh, now fabulous. great if it works out then it'll be just brilliant uh, although it has not always been successful to find somebody outside of uh, india or at least not outside within uh, it has been very difficult to find somebody outside of the turfy circle mm-hmm. because they have apparently my my transphobic uh, reputation has preceded my <laughs> ah. i don't know yeah so they kind of hear my name and they either not want to engage with me or they respond saying well this is a one woman from this website called fiverr she said but clearly this is a very important topic but i'm not sure how i feel about working in a film that might put trans people in a bad light so good luck with your project this is one of the milder responses that i have got mm. and i think so so isn't this even more shameful for you to acknowledge that this is a worthy project and that they are being abused and it is wrong and you still don't want to partake in it mm. what kind of an absolute spineless attitude is this that you have this blind allegiance to an ideology that you don't, that you probably don't even understand fully true but because social stigma dictates that social um, i don't know this this um, ideology dictates that you are supposed to give your full allegiance or else so these women are just like oh well it's a good project but you know i'd rather not bye bye some just don't respond at all some block me and things like that so ultimately we have i still have like a very small number of uh, women who do the animation and then there are some tech related um, people here in chennai who have been thankfully friends with me despite all of these things some of them are men and they don't mind me knocking at their studio at odd hours getting <laughs> them last minute requests because everything about my life is last minute right now i wanted to get this teaser out it was last minute i wanted to get music done it was last minute everything i'm just living life last minute right now <laughs> getting everything <laughs> you're constantly on the go <laughs> yes. so you've you've got um you've got mostly women and some men helping with the film um obviously the women who are telling their stories are from all over the world but those who are helping you with the the creative and the tech side of it they they're mostly um in the indian continent yes mostly yeah. from the indian continent the three animators were really brilliant with their art and we we are not in the same city so we can't have that you know the charged up discussion about things as well um, funnily i talked to them just like i'm talking to you over zoom you know it's it's a challenge not to be able to have 
a, a, a team that often happens in studios where the entire film crew sits in a room, sits in a studio and works together, discusses, brainstorms. So I've never had that luxury ever. Even mm. before COVID, before the whole concept of working from different parts of the world, I have been doing that. My film on workplace sexual harassment, the first and only film on that topic in India, was done with an all-female crew as well, a German editor, a Swiss musician, and you know, uh, I'm an American, Indian American graphic designer slash illustrator, things like that. I used to do that much before because for me, what I want is I want a really talented woman to. I want to work with a really talented woman. I don't care where she's from. I can somehow make it happen. Is how I used to always think of that. Because, um, what what would you do then if you don't find somebody in your own city? Do you not make that film? You can't mm. be dissuaded that way, right? So you have to find ways in which you can expand your uh, um, how how you source your team and things like that so that i've been doing that for a long time but large majority of them are in india they're all amazing and they're all constant they constantly worry that i don't sleep and things like that but you know that's how life is and for anybody who wants to see how amazing the creativity and the animations and the the editing is you've given us a little bit in the in the teaser video the latest one that you've put out um and um whilst you can't see it on this podcast let's have a little listen to the women um themselves speaking who have um been wonderfully animated or their faces are shown they're talking directly to camera but you've put them in the most um beautiful and amazing artistic environment um which just makes the whole film um gives it a and their stories a a, a lift and um a, a focus and, and an interest um that i i think is so really well done so let's have a little listen to those voices now anyone who's experiencing abuse or infidelity it's not getting better get out get yourself out of this do not allow yourself to be persuaded or influenced by blandishments and manipulative arguments. Try to extricate yourself, figure out the finances. There is nothing you can be or do that will make you the object of his affection. He is the object of his affection. It's like my dad died when I was 11, but I didn't realize. And I've been mourning him for 40 years. On the left, it's axiomatic that the untold stories will be told. This particular untold story, no one wants to hear. No matter what hardships the trans widow has gone through, people just make it to be our choice and consent. That is how society makes everything our responsibility, so that our abusers can continue to do whatever they want. In a marriage where your partner started to use drugs, or cheated on you, you would find therapists, support groups, and other women who would say, this is not your fault. But on this topic, people are very quick to question whether or not you responded to it correctly. Because a lot of what we're describing is familiar patterns of domestic abuse. And it's quite a big leap for people to make from hearing the stunning and brave story with the woman who goes along with it, to hearing our story, the woman who talks about how she's been abused, it's hardly covered at all. Women are finding us by Googling trans widows. What's been really surprising from looking at the website traffic is just geographically where a lot of these women are. Countries like Russia, Japan, Saudi Arabia, you know, if we're going through it here and we're being silenced, how much worse must it be for all of those women in cultures where women don't have a voice at all. Because I think it happens in all cultures, in all religions, in all societies. This is not just a thing that happens to only white, American, or European people. When AGPs are fetishizing women's oppression, you have to ask yourself, is it even more likely that they're going to be fetishizing it in countries where women are even more oppressed? 
So, I mean, when you've given birth to two kids, and especially when they are still small, the sex life just takes a back seat. And this was his way of telling me that because I was so absent in his eyes, or rather rejecting him, and that I gave him no choice but to act that way. Look what you made me do. This might seem as though it's the end of everything for you, and it might seem as though it's the end of your life, everything you had or believed you had, um, but it isn't. J.K. Rowling has like a quote that uh, rock bottom is a great place to launch off from. That is the spot where you get to recreate and redefine what's important. If people choose to be horrible to me and to insult me and call me names, then so be it. I will not be silent about it. Not for my sake. The damage is done to my life now. But for the sake of women everywhere who are being silenced on this subject, I'm speaking out for those people. I cannot tell you how much happier I am now than I ever was in my marriage. It's better on the other side. Yeah. It's so powerful to hear those women speak and the way that you are helping to deliver those stories in this film. Do you think there will be some people who watch the film and it shifts their attitudes a little or changes their mind about autogynephilia and how we as feminists or women's rights activists campaign for women's rights and the extent to which we include autogynephilic men. Um, do you think do you think that will help shift anybody's thinking? I certainly hope so. Many people make films for many reasons, and I have often made films that probably never end up in these film festival circles, not because the film's not good, but because it's just controversial, nobody wants to touch it. Mm -hmm. um, so some, film fe some films um, are just made to create that sort of a perception change in the society. You know, you did not know about something, here, I'm handing you information about that thing. You watch it, you consume it, and then you make up your own mind about whether you were right or wrong before about this subject. Usually, I believe that most of my films should sort of approach a subject matter like that. All my films have sort of started with the whole laying down the the experience of people who say things as they are based on their experience. And then I never take a sort of position where I'm saying, well, this is bad when that is good. No, I am just putting these pieces together for people mm -hmm. to make up their own mind. This is for two reasons. One, it's very easy for people to already criticize somebody like me having made this film. Even before I made this film, people have branded it transphobic. People have branded it a Nazi film. People have branded it uh, a hateful film because apparently we're calling them uh, the women are calling themselves widows and it is just a shameful thing that we are making a film on this subject while calling ourselves that, etc. Now, change is what is constant. You know, when it comes to a perception about things or understanding about things, change is the only thing that's constant. I used to believe that trans women are women. Mm -hmm. Donkey years ago, I used to believe that. And that is because I was not presented an evidence or presented some, some kind of a thing, like a film or a book at that time. I just believed it because that's what a large majority of people said. Yeah. Similarly, in our context, in our film's context, a large majority of people are calling these adult males stunning and brave. It is so easy for us to be um, falling in line with the rest of the world to say, well, of course they are stunning and brave. But... It takes a very small group of people to sort of put a break there and look at it from a critical point of view. Well, it is stunning and brave or whatever it is that you're calling it. Let's just hold that thought there. Have we really touched upon all the other aspects of this stunning and brave narrative? 
or are we only looking at this man who is who's got this book deals and uh, runs very very successful shows online and things like that is it possible that there is some back story to it which is darker which is probably riddled with uh, pain and trauma that you're not even talking about because you're so fixated on the trauma and the pain of the person who's smiling wearing wigs and having silicon mm. breasts and things like that so i hope that we will be able to tear apart that visual that people have that perception that people have and have them look on the other side of that mirror and that's why i've named the film as well that way because men look at women um as a, as a mirror these men who fetishize female bodies female everything they look at us as mirror they just want to emulate us they they just want to oppress us they just want to be us so what's really going on behind the mirror where the actual woman exists mm-hmm. what is she feeling what is she saying have you ever thought about that so i hope that people who constantly talk about oh fetishes are bad oh porn consumption is so bad and uh, any anybody who is uh, constantly watching pornography has this twisted view about women etc there are people who would say that but when it comes to agp fetishization they suddenly don't want to say much about it while still believing porn is bad but not talking about this as a fetish that could be misogynistic and harmful and glorifying sexual stereotypes which feminists are trying to break so i hope that the film will sort of bring in some sort of a um conversation starter in in a group of uh, people who have different viewpoints and let them make up their own mind based on the stories that these women are saying i am not going to manipulate their stories it is their stories that's that's what happened to them i'm just going to put them in a way that it is uh, watchable in a linear form and you know you make up your mind as to what you think uh, happens to these women whether there are some good men who have these fetishes who have somehow uh, won the right to violate uh, their wives and that somehow these wives are okay with it you make up your mind whether all the men who do this to women are just plain wrong they are not supposed to do that their wives don't deserve to have those experience had handed over to them the children don't deserve to grow up watching all of these things happen to them it's bad enough that in a world riddled with domestic abuse and domestic violence and sexual abuse of generic nature that children are so traumatized and growing up to be problematic individuals it's bad enough that we live in a world like this now you add this other layer without a moment's thought about what's going on to the wife what's going on to the children that's i think is just cruel it it's it's beyond cruel it's criminal mm-hmm. and i hope that the film will definitely if not a complete paradigm shift but at least open people's minds and yeah maybe have some difficult conversation with themselves because admitting to ourselves that we were wrong is a very difficult thing to do yeah um, though i i have absolutely no qualms in admitting that i was wrong before at all but i know how hard it is so i hope that people who have held different viewpoints in the past would look at the stories of these women and believe that any man no matter what his views about biological sex is or what his views about uh, the way of the world is etc it's just not fair to the wife and children that's it period agreed we've talked about the film the challenges of making the film how you are quite a lone voice feminist voice in india um working hard to get the truth out about what's happening to women and children you can't do this without money yeah unfortunately not um money unfortunately is one of the most important factors in this particular industry because i might try and learn 100 different things and do it by myself i might not consider my time um that is somehow warranted compensation in terms of financial compensation or whatever but there are things that i cannot help uh, spend i have to spend money on those things like studio costs and animator costs and music and sound production and color grading and all of those things though i know a fair deal of 
all of those things, but I'm still not a professional. And yeah. I think it'll be madness and I'll die of exhaustion if I end up doing all of those things by <laughs> myself too. So I, I do need somebody to kind of, you know, pitch yeah. in and do other departments as well. So money comes in to play a very big role in completing a project, any project actually. And especially in a project that is very dependent, very highly dependent on animated visuals, it's even more so because these animator animations are drawn, they, they're time consuming and they're drawn frame by frame by frame. It's a long and arduous procedure. And I, for one, want to work with women because I want to be able to pay them. Yes. Otherwise, I would just be such a hypocrite to say, I only work with women, only I never pay them. I oh, can't be yeah. that person. <laughs> mm -hmm. So any donation that comes into uh, the film goes directly towards the production of the film, be it studio costs or getting some softwares or things like that. And mm -hmm. largely for the time of these amazing women who have helped me in any shape or form to complete the film, they, it, it goes to them. And it's it. I hope it feels good to donate to a project like this because it's going to women, you know, yes. and I hope that people see this as a as a plus that it's not just that they are donating f f to making a film that's of an important uh, social issue, etc. But it's a film largely made by women and all the money is going to women, which is going to be such a shocking thing because women never get paid. If Even if they do, it's not even yeah. significant. It's not even close to how much men get in this industry. So no. how much do you need? Oh, I don't know. I've been joking about if I don't raise enough, I might have to sell a kidney. <laughs> <laughs> oh, V, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, saying that the thing is, I, I'm unable to kind of decide on a number just yet because um, the fi for the final film, the edit is ongoing. And it's very, very difficult for me right away to assume that I will need only, say, five minutes of animation per character because I might choose to involve a little bit more of her towards the end. Then I will need animation for that. So it's an evolving financial situation at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'll only know at the end of uh, the, at least the rough cut is done. I'll only yeah. know how much of animation has been done. Therefore, how much of it, uh, how, how much the animators are going to charge me, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. because I haven't got a rough cut yet, it's a, it's a kind of a conundrum if you really think about it. I can only have the rough cut if I will be able to pay the animators because they have already worked on something. Mm -hmm. And I'll uh, if I don't pay them, I might not be able to finish the rough cut. If you understand what I'm saying, it's a kind of a tricky situation. Although the yeah. women are really kind and kind and generous with their time, I I still have the pressure of figuring out ultimately just how much animation I need in the film. And when can I sort of sign them off, like be done with the work so that I know exactly how much they're going to charge me. And so I'll know how much I have to raise and things like yeah. that. It's a very, very tricky production, this one. And animation is really intensive, isn't it? It's a, it's hours and hours of work for minutes it on is. screen. It is. Um, so um, I, I, I know you don't want to put... Um, and you, you say you can't put a number on it, but I'm going to say we need to raise... We're, we're talking thousands here, people, please, um, to get this um, film finished. And we're hoping to get it out by the end of the year. Um, and, of course, we want all of those women to be paid for their work um, towards an amazing project. Um, you have already on your trailer explained about... Um, Again, why you need the donations and how people can donate or buy the merch. Um, and we'll, we'll play that again here. Filmmaking is a time-consuming job and it is highly dependent on two things. Building a strong, like-minded team and, of course, money. And ever since I started talking about the harms of gender identity ideology, my access to both these things have been snatched away. The more controversial I get, the lesser my chances of finding collaborators and funding. Suffice to say, it is a lonely and exhausting job to take on several aspects of filmmaking all by myself. But with the help of a very small team, 
and the feminist support from women world over, I hope I will execute this project just like I did dysphoric. But I need your help. Max, Male Allies Challenging Sexism is a group of pro-feminist men challenging male violence against women in all its forms through events, actions and activism. They have come forward to collaborate with me on this project as a fundraising partner. Considering how much work women-led feminist groups take on, it is good that Max have stepped in to pull the weight. While women donate so generously towards this fight, I hope Max will be able to persuade men too to come forward and support projects like mine. 100% of funds donated via Max go into making the film, and you can donate as little or as much as you can. Another way to support my film involves owning some pretty fabulous merchandise. Women's Rights Network and Violet Wind have introduced a new line called Fearless Female on their merch store to raise funds for Behind the Looking Glass. You can choose from a long list of things like t-shirts, hoodies, water bottles, mugs, tote bags, phone cases and such. Every time you buy from the store, 75% of the proceeds go into the film. Now you get to own something pretty amazing while also contributing to making a very important documentary. We are building eight characters from scratch who have to remain anonymous due to possible dangers from their ex-partners. So your donation will help me bring those characters to life. Your donation will also help me with the huge expenditure towards post-production. As many of you know, I try to always work with an all-female crew. So by supporting this film, you are in turn supporting all the women in the crew. Behind the Looking Glass, in all likelihood, is the first ever documentary made on this subject. And together, we can create a historic piece of film that will remain on the internet for posterity. To finish up, what else would you like to let people know about the film? I want to let people know that once the film is complete, it's our film. It's going to be out for all of us to watch, share, distribute, screen, wherever they want it. It'll be free. Because it, it will be free because it makes no sense that you want desperately for the story to be heard and put it behind a paywall and make it harder for people to watch. Mm -hmm. Dysphoric was free. This would also be free. I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment to try and send this film to a few festivals to see what kind of response we'd get because we are not necessarily saying anything, quote unquote, transphobic. We are only talking about the wives and their stories. Yeah. I'm going to be really smart in the way I'm making the film. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the festivals respond to a film like this. Mm. They might just they might just re reject it without any explanation, but it would still be interesting to know how many rejections we've got for uh, even for a film which maybe is about women's abuse or women's empowerment and festivals yeah. like that. It'll be really interesting to see what happens. But right after a, a very short festival run, I'm just going to have the film available for free. In fact, if anything, I'd encourage people to have a screening anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. Um, hopefully yeah. have me, have uh, the women in the film, if she is in your locality or in your city to have her come and talk more about the about the experience and mm. basically just put trans widows in the middle of this whole ideological debate. Yes. Uh, it's it's about time. Agreed. Vaishnavi Sundar, thank you for talking to us. Thank you so much for having me, sis. To donate, head over to limesodafilms.com slash donate. That's limesodafilms.com slash donate. And you can see the links to the PayPal and to Violet Vend to buy the Fearless Female merch. Thank you.